Okay, good evening, everybody. And welcome to St. George's Talks. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, und willkommen in St. Georg's Gespräche. A series of monthly talks, always the third Tuesday of the month, on themes pertaining to Germany or local interest to this church, St. George's, which has stood here since 1762. A German Lutheran community built this church um, as immigrants to this country um, almost a quarter of a millennium ago. And they operated in this area largely as sugar bakers, but obviously other industries as well as they became integrated. And this church built by them for servicing their, in their community. My name is Rick Jones and I am on the committee that looks after this, what is now a historic building. It's not, not functioned as a, a regular church since the 1990s. Um, when September comes round again this year, we will um, have a, a, a monthly organ vespers, organ vesper uh, from this church, which is uh, part religious worship, part concert. A series of um, organists are invited to come and play our wheezy old evocative sounding set of pipes behind you in the balcony. Behind you here in the hall, that is. Obviously, there's a large audience and welcome to you two at home who are with us tonight virtually online. I, the, the speaker this evening is a traveler and lecturer um, of great experience. There is almost nothing about German culture and history that uh, he doesn't know. Um, I speak because I've known uh, the speaker for very many years. When I was young and unshaven, he taught me German. And there are more than just me in this audience this evening who, would, who can say the same. Frank Pitt Patterson, has, who is our speaker tonight, has taught many generations of young people over the years not just German language, but about the whole history of the nation, the culture, everything. In fact, the first one of the first lessons we had involved drinking glue vine, which was probably against the school rules back then, but we got away with it anyway. Would you now please welcome our speaker tonight, please, Frank Patterson of many years standing. Thank you. This is the, uh, the difficult bit, everybody. Bear with me, please. You know, I should be getting the... Oh, is it? Or is it this one here, PowerPoint presentation? Double click. Oh, Screen screen sharing. So, yeah. I said that I said this was the most difficult bit by far. Get getting uh, getting started. Um, it's a great pleasure to be. Yeah, it's um, it's a great pleasure to be addressing this group for the fourth time. Also a great joy to be working with Rick yet again. 
um, I first taught you, Rick, um, exactly 50 years ago uh, when you were 16. So that gives Rick's age away. Probably also gives mine away as well. I'm hoping to now uh, to get started. I think I may need technical help in a moment. Yeah, here we here we go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, welcome to what must be my favourite city in Germany. First of all, where is Nuremberg? It's situated in the southeast of Germany, in the state of Bavaria, Bayern in German. More precisely, it lies in the northern part of Bavaria, Franconia, Franken, which has a proud separate history. It consists of Upper, Middle and Lower Franconia, and the most important city and unofficial capital, Nuremberg, lies here in Middle Franconia. I just need to move things a bit. Imo, can you help me to... I just need to move these out. Oh, the projector fell down. Yeah. How do I move all of these out of the way? Oh, you don't. Yeah. 
Well, as I said, um, Franconia, Franca has a proud... She was coming on your Bluetooth. So back to Franconia, Franken, and Nuremberg is the unofficial capital of Franconia. The Franconia and the former free imperial city of Nuremberg are part of Bavaria is down to Napoleon. During the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon rewarded his ally Bavaria for its support by elevating it to the status of a kingdom and allowing it to increase its territory by absorbing Franconia. The Bavarian takeover was and still is greatly resented in Franconia. It's never been a happy union and there's a great rivalry between Franconia and Bavaria, extending even to whose sausages are best, and rather more seriously, who's better at football, Bayern Munich or FC Nuremberg. Nuremberg was first mentioned in 1050, when it was the site of an imperial castle, Kaiserburg. It stands on a rocky outcrop and dominates the city. The Holy Roman Empire, that thousand year empire, which lasted from Charlemagne to the beginning of the 19th century, had no fixed capital. And the emperors maintained castles and palaces in a number of cities, including Prague and Vienna. But over the centuries, the emperor of the day resided more often in Nuremberg than in any of his other castles and palaces. The castle was extended and is largely what we see today. The medieval city was surrounded by a massive city wall and ditch. In hundreds of years, its defenses were breached only once by the American Seventh Army on Hitler's birthday in 1945. The formidable wall was three and a half miles in length and an average of 25 feet high, guarded by towers. and spanning the river with bridges. By the middle of the 13th century, Nuremberg had become a free imperial city, which is to say subject only to the emperor himself and a prosperous trading center, favored by its position on important trading routes, which connected it with the Baltic, Augsburg, Florence, Venice, and Rome, and via Leipzig with Spain, France, Poland, and Russia. An English guidebook of 1858 describes medieval Nuremberg thus, the greatest and most wealthy of all the free imperial cities, the residence of emperors, the seat of diets, the focus of the trade of Asia and Europe, the most important manufacturing town in Germany, the home of German freedom and art, the cradle of the fine arts of poetry, and of almost numberless inventions. In 1356, the Emperor Charles IV named Nuremberg as the place where every newly elected ruler had to hold his first imperial diet. Nuremberg thus became one of the centers of the empire, effectively its capital. In the 15th century, Nuremberg was further honored when the Emperor Sigismund decreed that the imperial crown jewels should be kept in Nuremberg in perpetuity. This is the iconic crown of the Holy Roman Empire with its eight panels and central arch. For 370 years, the imperial crown jewels remained in Nuremberg from, the, from where they were removed only to be taken to Frankfurt when a new emperor was elected. During the Napoleonic Wars, they were taken to the safety of Vienna, where they remained until Hitler had them brought back to Nuremberg with great ceremony in 1938. After the war, the Americans returned them to Vienna, where they can be seen today. And these copies are displayed in the City Museum in Nuremberg. 
in Nuremberg, the crown jewels were kept in the chapel of the Heiliggeist Spital, the hospital of the Holy Spirit, whose tower you see on the left. Like most of the city, the church and the hospital were destroyed in the last war. Now beautifully restored, the hospital of the, of the Holy Spirit is one of the sites of Nuremberg, but few give the church tower a second glance or realize that this was the home of the imperial crown jewels for almost four centuries. Nuremberg's golden age spanned two centuries from 1500 to 1700. It was a center of remarkable creativity with advances in science, mechanical invention, painting, sculpture, and printing. As we shall see, it was also the city of the Meisterzinger. Martin Luther said that Nuremberg, enclosed within its city walls and dominated by its castle and churches, shone over the whole of Germany like a sun amid the moon and stars. Luther also called the city the eye and the ear of Germany. With over 20 printing houses, it was the media center of the time. This very early copy of Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which launched the Reformation, was printed in Nuremberg in 1517. A few years later in 1525, Nuremberg was the first German city to adopt the Protestant religion. Nuremberg's most famous son was the leading figure in this golden age. Albrecht Dürer is one of Germany's greatest artists and the first to gain an international reputation as his fame spread throughout Europe. Indeed, his monogram was one of the, the world's first commercial logos. His work bridges the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. This Christ-like self-portrait dated 1500, which is now in Munich, is one of his best known works. Dürer lived and worked in this house, which like most of the center of Nuremberg was destroyed in the war and rebuilt stone by stone. Perhaps Dürer's famous four horsemen of the apocalypse anticipates the devastation that would be visited on his city. Appropriately, several of Dürer's works are displayed in the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg, the lar largest art museum in the German-speaking world. To the right is his portrait of the Emperor Sigismund, he who decreed that Nuremberg should permanently house the crown jewels, and to the left is Charlemagne with the crown jewels, including the famous crown. It's a fine portrait, although historically inaccurate, as the crown was first used over a century after the death of Charlemagne, but perhaps we can al allow Dürer some artistic license. The Nuremberg collection is Dürer's painting of his teacher, Michael Wohlgemuth. Just look at the detail, the lips, the wisps of hair, the folds of the flesh, the eyes. But Dürer owes his international fame not only to his sublime skill as an artist. He was born in the right city at the right time and being a shrewd businessman, realized the potential of the printing press. Using this new technology, he mass produced thousands of his etchings and woodcuts, selling between four and 5,000 copies of one print alone, this one, the rhinoceros. He'd never seen a rhinoceros and based his drawing on a journalist's description adding whiskers because animals have whiskers. Around the year 1500, four giants of the German Renaissance were working in Nuremberg. Albrecht Dürer, the painter and engraver, Adam Kraft, a master craftsman in stone, Veit Stoss in wood, and Peter Fischer in bronze. This old photograph shows the two great cathedral-like Gothic churches which dominate the center of the city, the Protestant churches of St. Sebald and St. Lawrence. 
both contain remarkable works by the Nuremberg masters. St. Thebold, or Zibaldus, the patron saint of Nuremberg, was an 11th century hermit and missionary to whom miracles were ascribed. He's buried in the church which bears his name, which brought pilgrims and money to the city. The focal point for the pilgrims was the bronze tomb of the saint, created by Peter Fisher over 10 years between 1507 and 1517. You'll find this copy in the V&A in London. And Nuremberg's other great Gothic church, St. Lawrence, also contains works by Nuremberg's masters. Another fine example of the German Renaissance, the Annunciation by the woodcarver Feitstoß, shows the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Archangel Gabriel. With its exquisite attention to detail, it could be Dürer painting, but carved in wood. In the same church, we find the towering tabernacle by Adam Kraft, a remarkable work of tracery, which rises 60 feet up into the vaulted roof of the church. It's far more elaborate than was needed to house the sacrament for communion, but it's a statement of both the master's skill and the wealth of his patron and Nuremberg merchant. Kraft has carved himself at the foot of the tower as though he's bearing its weight on his shoulders. An important member of Nuremberg's remarkable generation of artists and scientists, one who's left a lasting legacy through the music of Richard Wagner, was the poet, shoemaker, and Meistersinger Hans Sachs. The Meistersinger were members of guilds of singers, amateurs from the artisan and trading classes who were primarily master craftsmen. Hans Sachs was a shoemaker, for example. They presented their unaccompanied songs at festivals and competed against one another for prestigious prizes. The movement flourished in towns and cities throughout Germany in the 15th and 16th centuries, and the Nuremberg School, with Hans Sachs as its leader, was the most distinguished. Nuremberg's Meistersinger have been immortalized in Wagner's opera, Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, which evokes the atmosphere of Nuremberg's golden age. Nuremberg in its golden age produced not only artists, but also scientists and engineers. The printer Anton Kohlberger, Albrecht Dürer's godfather, recognized the commercial potential of the printing press and established Europe's first printing house in Nuremberg. In, 19, in 1492, Martin Beheim from Nuremberg designed possibly the first ever globe of the world and certainly the oldest surviving one. Peter Heinlein from Nuremberg is regarded as the father of modern clocks and is credited with the invention of the first pocket watches. By the time of his death, his clocks and watches were sold all over Europe. This timepiece by Heinlein, dated 1505, is under two inches across and would have been worn as a pendant, a most impressive status symbol. In the Holy Roman Empire at this time, there was a saying, if I had Venice's power, Augsburg's splendor, Nuremberg's esprit, Strasbourg's weapons and Orm's money, I would be the richest man in the world. And by esprit was meant creative spirit and openness to innovation. The heart of the city was and still is the grand market Hauptmarkt. To the left, we see the Church of Our Lady, Foreign Kirche, and to the right, the so-called beautiful fountain. The Foreign Kirche was built in the 14th century as a Roman Catholic church, as they all were. When Nuremberg embraced the Protestant religion in the 16th century, it became a Lutheran church, but was returned to the Catholic church when Nuremberg was absorbed into Catholic Bavaria. The Holy Roman Empire was not ruled by one dynasty. When the emperor died, his successor was chosen by seven prince electors. This glockenspiel on the facade of the Foreign Kirche shows the electors paying homage to the emperor who would be bound to hold his first imperial diet here in Nuremberg. 
The other main feature of the Grand Market is the magnificent 14th century beautiful fountain. Richly decorated with 40 figures from history, it's one of the sites of Nuremberg and a Gothic masterpiece. Here we see Alexander the Great to the left and to the right, some of the seven prince electors of the Holy Roman Empire. The fountain and the church form the backdrop to the Christmas market, Chris Kindle's market, one of the world's oldest Christmas fairs. It too goes back to Nuremberg's golden age, being first recorded in the early 17th century. From the bright lights of the Christmas market to darkness, this 1930s postcard is a reminder that the square was renamed Adolf Hitler Square as early as 1933. This post of the square advertises Nuremberg as the city of the party rallies. And this photograph of the square shows that the city welcomed Hitler with enthusiasm. We shall return to this dark chapter in Nuremberg's history later. Nuremberg's golden age came to an end towards the end of the 17th century. During the Thirty Years' War, it suffered enormous human and economic losses. Protestant Nuremberg and its Swedish garrison under King Gustavus Adolphus were besieged by the Catholic Emperor's forces. And though the city was never taken, some 40,000 citizens were killed or died of hunger and disease. The population halved and the city's decline was accelerated. Once one of Europe's leading commercial centers, Nuremberg was overtaken by cities like Hamburg and London, which had access to the new overseas trading routes. Its decline was hastened by its own restrictive practices. All the Jewish merchants were expelled and the guilds refused to admit the weavers exiled from France and Flanders who were welcomed by Nuremberg's competitors. A long period of stagnation was followed by humiliation. When the Holy Roman Empire collapsed and Napoleon's troops occupied Nuremberg. In 1806, the city was awarded to Bavaria, which Napoleon had elevated to the status of a kingdom. And the citizens of the former free imperial city of Nuremberg were reluctantly the subjects of the Bavarian king Maximilian. This at least had the advantage that Bavaria took on the huge debts that Nuremberg had accumulated during a century of decline. This would prepare the ground for a new beginning. With Bavarian money, the city's trade and commerce revived. Within a few years, Nuremberg had once more become a center of enterprise and innovation as it embraced the Industrial Revolution. In 1835, Germany's first passenger railway connected Nuremberg and Fürth. The locomotive der Adler was built by Robert Stevenson. In 2008, a reproduction of this first train traveled the same journey. The city welcomed new manufacturing industries. For example, MAN, the predecessor of the engineering company MAN was founded in Nuremberg in the 1840s. Faber-Castell founded in Stein, a leafy suburb of Nuremberg, is the world's oldest pencil manufacturer and still a world leader, now has factories in 22 countries. The electrical company Schuckert was founded in the 1870s and it is, at, at its height employed 10,000 workers on the outskirts of Nuremberg. The company's continuing success led to a merger with Siemens, which remains Nuremberg's leading employer. And appropriately Siemens today supplies the city's trams. It was Nuremberg's good fortune, but in some ways it's downfall. The thanks to the initiative of the Crown Prince of Bavaria, the center of the city was given protected status, which as we've seen, forced the industry out into the suburbs. This perfectly preserved medieval city with a glorious past attracted the romantic movement of the 19th century and Richard Wagner used it as the inspiration for his opera. 
Nuremberg, the most German of German cities, came to represent traditional Germany. In the 1920s, the Nazis who sought legitimacy by presenting themselves as the successor to Germany's imperial past saw Nuremberg as the ideal setting for their rallies. This poster makes the point. It reads, Nuremberg, the German city, from the city of the imperial diets to the city of the party rallies. The majority of posters for the rallies featured images of imperial Nuremberg with the castle and the towers. From an early date, the Nazis had a strong base in Bavaria. Hitler's failed beer hall putsch took place in Munich in 1923, and Munich would later be officially known as the capital of the Nazi movement. The Nazis also had much support in middle Franconia, the region surrounding Nuremberg, and the police were known to be sympathetic to their aims. One of Hitler's earliest supporters and a lifelong ally, uh, Julius Streicher, who marched with him in, in Munich, founded the Nuremberg Nazi Party in 1922 and later became the powerful Gauleiter of Franconia. He was a fanatical anti Semite and the founder of Der Sturmer, published in Nuremberg from 1923. This was an obscene publication which spread vicious anti Jewish propaganda and by the late 1930s had a circulation of almost half a million. The line at the bottom of the page, Die Juden sind unser Unglück, the Jews are our misfortune, appeared on the front page of every edition. The Nazis held their first mass rally in 1927, six years before Hitler became chancellor. Nuremberg was the obvious venue, not only for the historical and political reasons already mentioned, but also on account of its central position in Germany and excellent rail links. When Hitler came to power in 1933, he decreed that the annual rallies would permanently be held in Nuremberg. The rallies were in symbolism. The columns of regular troops, the SS, the Hitler Youth, and all the other Nazi organizations marched through the, medieval castle, through the medieval city and past the Imperial Castle to the rally grounds, linking Nuremberg's glorious past with Germany's dynamic future. A further advantage of Nuremberg was that it possessed a large public park incorporating a memorial hall, which you see there. This was converted by the Nazis into a huge parade ground, the Luitpold Arena where Hitler, in a quasi-religious ritual, honored those who died for the Nazi cause. The ceremonies were always on the grand scale, with Hitler at the center. The spectators were made to feel that they were part of something great, historic, though they themselves were small and insignificant. What you've just seen down here in the corner was only a small part of the huge complex designed by Hitler's architect, Albert Speer. His plans included a Congress hall, the German stadium holding over 400,000 spectators, a parade ground for the army, the Zeppelin field, a gigantic arena for war games, the March field, and a camp for the various Nazi organizations participating. The design of the Congress Hall, as you might guess, was inspired by the Colosseum, but in a horseshoe with a roof. The hall would have had seats for, for 50,000. Building began in 1935, but the project was never completed and remained a shell. One of several grandiose Nazi schemes which remained unfinished or, like Hitler's proposed new capital, Germania, didn't even begin. This was the case with the gigantic German stadium with its planned 400,000 capacity. It was scheduled to be completed by 1945, but work never progressed beyond the excavation of a huge pit for the foundations. 
after 1945, part of this huge hole was used as a dumping ground for rubble from the destroyed city, enough to form a mound, which was covered with topsoil and planted with trees to form a low hill. And the rest of the hole became an artificial lake. The Zeppelin field was one of the few parts of the complex to be completed. Based on the Pergamon altar, it's typical of monumental Nazi architecture. We'll see shortly what remains of it today. A capacity of well over 300,000. All eyes were directed to Hitler's podium. At night, 150 army searchlights pointing up into the sky transformed the stadium into a cathedral of light, a spectacular sight. The rallies were glorified in Leni Riefenstahl's propaganda film, Triumph of the Will. In the stadium today, like Hitler's Third Reich, it was supposed to last for a thousand years, but the stone began to crumble after just a few years. It still holds a great fascination though. 150,000 visitors a year come to the ruined stadium and silently stand where Hitler used to stand as my own A-level students are doing in this picture. Hitler used the 1935 Nuremberg rally as the platform for announcing the Nuremberg race laws. Jews were stripped of German citizenship, forbidden to marry or have sexual relations with Germans and deprived of all their civil and political rights. Within a few years, Jewish children were forbidden to go to school. All men had to add Israel to their name and women, Sarah. This incredible table helps you to establish how Jewish you are and who you're allowed to marry. The Jews had returned to Nuremberg during the period of industrial expansion in the late 19th century and played a leading role in the city's economy. This 1920s postcard shows the principal synagogue on the right with a statue of the poet Hans Sachs on the left. In November 1938 on Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, Jewish homes and shops were looted and synagogues destroyed, the prelude to the Holocaust. Finally, the world became aware of the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime. Here, Gauleiter Streicher, speaking outside the synagogue in 1938, orders its destruction with a quotation from De Meisterzinger, Fang at Fang, get started. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, thousands of Jews had already left, but seven and a half thousand were still living in the city. Before the outbreak of war, a further 5,000 Nuremberg Jews emigrated or moved to other parts of Germany. Of the two and a half thousand who stayed, 1,600 were deported to extermination camps where few survived. When the American army liberated Nuremberg in 1945, only 40 Jews remain, remained, probably saved because the air raids had destroyed the Gestapo's records. Today, the Jewish population of Nuremberg numbers about 2,200, 2,200, most of them refugees from the former Soviet Union. The Nuremberg rallies traditionally began in the Opera House with the performance of Die Meistersinger, and it seems appropriate that the last opera performed in the partially bombed out house in 1945 was Wagner's Goethe Dämon, The Twilight of the Gods. The end was near. In 59 separate air raids, some 8,000 British and American bombers destroyed 90% of the historic center. 6,500 were killed and over twice that number injured. In the final land battle, a further 1,000 German and American soldiers lost their lives. Few German cities were more heavily bombed than Nuremberg, but, in the context of the war, it was a legitimate target. As a major industrial center, it produced armaments, armaments and munitions. Firms like MAN and Siemens 
provided military vehicles, aircraft, and electrical equipment. Nuremberg was also an important rail hub on the routes from north to south and east to west. Finally, the British and Americans were well aware that this was the spiritual home of the Nazi movement. It had welcomed Hitler with enthusiasm and would pay a heavy price for its folly. A couple walk through the remains of Adolf Hitler Square. What would the future hold for Nuremberg? First, there would be a reckoning. The war trials were held in Nuremberg for two reasons. Most importantly, Nuremberg, more than any other city, was associated with the rise of the Nazi party. And secondly, the Palace of Justice had a courtroom which was undamaged and large enough to accommodate the hundreds of lawyers, defendants, guards, and press. In the first trial, which lasted 11 months, 24 leading Nazis were charged with conspiracy to wage address aggressive war, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. 12 were sentenced to death by hanging, including the Franconian Gauleiter, Julius Streicher here, here seen with the architect Albert Speer, who was given a sentence of 20 years. Streicher, the rabid anti-Semite, was completely unrepentant, accusing the judges of being Jewish and shouting Heil Hitler as he went to the scaffold. After the war, Nuremberg had to face two difficult decisions. What to do with a city that was 90% destroyed and how to come to terms with its nasty Nazi past. As early as 1947, the city council considered three possibilities. One, to leave the city as a, as, a, as a gigantic ruin, as a warning of the consequences of blindly supporting an evil regime. Two, to use the rubble to fill the city's moat, level the ground and build a new city with modern buildings and broader streets. Or three, without in any way diminishing Nuremberg's responsibility for its part in the crime of the Nazis, to rebuild a city that had once been the glory of Germany in the original style with narrow cobbled streets and half timbered houses. And this is what they chose. As can be imagined, the rebuilding was a massive project which took decades. The majority of buildings were rebuilt in the original style or at least in a way that was compatible with the pre-war townscape. This city mansion, the Tucher Palais, was built for the wealthy Tucher family in the early 18th century. In 1945, only the facade was left standing here on the right. The facade was secured and over several years, the surrounding rubble was cleared. Finally, the mansion was completely rebuilt, the only house in that wasteland to be restored. And here it is today, one of the best addresses in Nuremberg. The church of St. Thebold was so badly damaged that the rebuilding took almost 30 years. Here's the church in 1945 and today. It's appropriate that in this church we find the Coventry Cross of Nails. Like many of the ruined churches of Germany, the Zerbaldeskirche has received a cross formed of nails from the ruins of Coventry Cathedral, destroyed by the Luftwaffe in 1940. After the war, the Coventry Cross was presented to ruined churches throughout Germany and Europe. And with its motto, Father, forgive, it's a powerful symbol of reconciliation. Every Friday, the Coventry Litany is spoken in this church and all the ruined churches which have received the Cross of Nails. The hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. Father, forgive. The covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Father, forgive. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Father, forgive. 
the priceless, beautiful fountain here to the right was easier to restore. It was saved because a courageous director of public works enclosed it in, enclosed it in concrete, thereby admitting that the city might be bombed, which the Nazis considered treason. Here's the beautiful fountain in 1946, undamaged, but surrounded by ruins. The monuments of two giants of Nuremberg's golden age survive while all around them is destroyed. Hans Sachs and Albrecht Dürer, his only company, two American GIs. I mentioned earlier the Hospital of the Holy Spirit in the chapel of which the Imperial Crown Jewels were kept for almost 400 years. Beautifully restored in the 1950s and one of the most photographed sites of Nuremberg, it now houses a very fine restaurant where you might enjoy Franconian sausages traditionally served on a pewter plate, accompanied by beer from the local brewery or Franconian wine. The former chapel and home of the crown jewels has been converted into seminar rooms and accommodation for old people, students, and refugees from places like Ukraine. The 10% of the center that wasn't totally destroyed, including Weissgerbergasse, or about 20 half-timbered houses survived the bombing virtually unscathed, while, other, while others have been lovingly restored by the owners and the civic society. The painstaking restoration continues to this day. This aerial photo with the castle at the top of the picture shows that within the city walls, the street patterns and the character of the medieval center have been preserved. My 1958 guide, sorry, my 1858 guidebook informs the visitor, the stranger arrived within its walls might fancy himself carried back to a distant century as he threads its irregular streets and examines its quaint gable-faced houses. And this is precisely how you feel as you walk through the streets of Nuremberg today. So I think I've answered the question, what can you do with a city that was 90% destroyed? My other question was, how would Nuremberg come to terms with its nasty, na Nazi past? Nowhere in Germany is more closely linked to the rise of the Nazi party than Nuremberg. For a long time, the city didn't know how to cope with this birth. But by the 1980s, it had made the decision that it would not hide from its past, but confront it honestly in an attempt to expose the dangers of racism and prejudice and to teach future generations not to, to commit the same folly. Nuremberg resolved that henceforth, it would be a city of peace, reconciliation and respect for human rights. I witnessed this desire at first hand when I was in, in Nuremberg with a school group in December, 1992. After brutal attacks on Turkish families by neo-Nazis in Northern Germany, which shocked the nation. 100,000 Nuremberg citizens formed a five kilometer long chain of lights around the city in a silent protest against race and xenophobia. Our pupils and I were proud to join them. In 1995, 60 years, almost to the day since the race, law, race laws were proclaimed in Nuremberg, the city established a foundation to support human rights throughout the world. An international committee would present a biennial award of 15,000 euros to individuals or groups who had displayed outstanding commitment to human rights, often at considerable personal risk. This initiative was given concrete form by the monumental way of human rights, which you can see through the arch. On every one of 30 columns, an article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is described in German and one other language. Nuremberg's efforts in the field of human rights have been recognized by UNESCO and the European Council. Nuremberg accepts that it will never shake off its reputation as the city of the rallies, but it's striving 
to be known also as the city of peace and human rights. Nuremberg puts the education of the young at the heart of its mission. On the crumbling site of the Nuremberg rallies, where the Nazis organized their propaganda campaign, a dramatic new exhibition in the Congress Hall slices through the wall of the building. Slices through the propaganda and the myth. The exhibition, Fascination and Terror, in the bare, unfinished walls of Hitler's Congress Hall demonstrates the power of rhetoric. The fascination of military might the dangers of a personality cult, the seductive appeal of populism. This is Nuremberg, the city of peace and human rights, confronting its past with honesty and a determination never again to repeat the folly of the past. In almost a thousand years, Nuremberg has experienced greatness and ignominy, but it faces the future with confidence. This evening, we've seen the glory of medieval Nuremberg. We have seen its fatal delusion, its terrible destruction, and its rebirth. To the accompaniment of Die Meisterzinger, I leave you with a few final images of this fascinating city. It's, um, it goes, the, the, I, I, um, those of you on Zoom may not have heard that. Um, why do we spell Nuremberg with an M and the Germans spell it with an M? Um, it goes back to the early years of printing and spelling. An M and an M are very similar to one another. And people weren't quite sure in both countries whether it was spelt with an N or an M. The Germans settled on the M and the British settled on the M. It is, however, the same place. <laughs> With the M, yeah. Nuremberg.
Well, at least we now know how to do it, but it's a bit more complicated than I thought. Mm. And these are all people who are oh, part of the Zoom meeting. Yes, I see. And one of them is you. Is there much? Evening, I, I, I was asked about relations between Krakow and Nuremberg, and in particular, it's interesting that, that, that you mentioned the remarkable work of Feitschloss. I showed the picture, the Annunciation, probably his greatest work is in Krakow, where he works, I think, probably more than in Nuremberg, the altar in the Church of St. Mary, which I'm sure you know just off, off the square. Uh, yes, the, the, there, was, there was a lot of commerce and a lot of uh, artistic exchange between the two cities. Jenny? Yes, this, uh, a, a, a comment I agree absolutely. The power of the two films that Leni Riefenstahl made, uh, in particular um, the 1935 film, The Triumph of the Will, are they ever shown in Germany? I've, I've, I've seen them in Germany, um, at not as a major cinema event, but, the, but they certainly are shown at meetings. They are tremendously powerful. It's it's absolutely brilliant film. 
and those images, as you know, are used over and over again in programs about the Third Reich. So no, and, um, Mein Kampf has been banned in, in Germany, as you know, but um, the, the films haven't been, so, as far as I'm aware, I've certainly seen them anyway. I can't can't hear can't hear the question. I'm afraid. Oh, oh it's. Oh. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the person who's asking me the question, could you ask it, please? You're asking the the wrong person. I I love my German beer. I don't drink Nuremberg red beer. I don't drink Bavarian wheat beer. I don't drink Düsseldorf amber beer. <laughs> so uh, I, it, it 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 rings a bell. And any any beer drinkers in the audience? Have you had red beer in? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I, the, the question was not in the, about red beer, was not in the least mundane, but I'm afraid I can't answer it. The, um, to Tim's question, how, how did it come that Nuremberg was the right place at the right time? Um, I think with creativity that people are inspired by what's around them. And certainly in, in, in the case of the printing press and in the case of this school of Albert Dürer, um, people were attracted to Nuremberg because those people were there. Um, in other words, it began with remarkable people who attracted others. That's the best answer I can give, I'm afraid, Tim. Um, Martin, Martin Luther found a ready audience, and, and as far as the Reformation was concerned, as I said, Nuremberg became Protestant very early on, just a few years after the 95 Theses. And I showed you the printed copy of the 95 Theses, 1517, that is the year 
that um, that Luther nailed up the 95 theses. And so th the fact that there was, um, that Martin Luther found a welcome home in Nuremberg, I think would also at have attracted people. So I, I think there were elements of people being attracted by great people that were already there. They, 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 they came back um, later that century, they were needed um, when the Industrial Revolution took off. Um, but no, they'd been, they'd been expelled. All, um, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, of Speyer, for example, you can think of lots of examples um, where, where, um, where, where, the, where the Jews were expelled and, and didn't come back for two or three centuries. And that was the case of Nuremberg. Thank you, uh, Frank, very much for uh, I think we uh, uh, have really uh, run out of time now for the next evening talk. Uh, I'm sure it, uh, you will agree with me uh, that this has demonstrated what an inspiring teacher uh, Frank was for me. I was here and remained today. That was uh, a very Engaging and delightful talk, so thank you very much. Um, just to say that in a month's time, the last lecture of this uh, current season is going to take place, and interestingly, perhaps in connection with Nuremberg's history, great centre of printing, talk is on the history of uh, German black letters.